And with that, it survived years and years of other movies and everyone still just loves Gremlins. What do you think is part of that staying power of this film? Well, I think that Joe Dante, the director, and Steven Spielberg, the executive producer, and Mike Fennell, the producer, did some very clever things in making the movie. Number one, when you watch the film, you'll notice there aren't really any references to any specific dates or events or times. So it can happen at any time. There's a couple of shots of the technology where you see a rotary phone, but there's really not a whole lot of tech in it either. So that doesn't date it. There aren't a lot of dated references really in the film. So it can, it, it, it does, it's not as dated as most movies are because it takes place in, a, in anywhere USA, you know, at Christmas. And it, it just is, um, it's very accessible and it, like, it doesn't date itself, that's one. And then number two, it has a fairly universal theme that everyone on the planet can relate to, which is the notion of rules and following the rules and our inner desire to break the rules and just, well, become like the gremlins are, which are basically rule breakers who do anything and, and everything that they feel like doing. They just follow their impulses and do it. And so I think that tension between how we live in our lives wanting to, you know, having to follow the rules, and some of us want to follow the rules, and then our secret kind of inner desire to just want to create, you know, chaos and mayhem and go out and, and party like, like, like the gremlins do, it is kind of a universal theme. So I think the combination of the, the theme and the, the fact that it still holds up and doesn't seem particularly dated, and also the fact that it's seasonal and takes place around Christmas uh, just keeps it relevant and watchable, you know, even four decades later. So, so for the record, this is a Christmas movie. Well, when we made it, you know, it was just supposed to be like a summer blockbuster and we were happy to see that it was. It, it made $150 million in the summer of 1984, which in today's money would be about close to half a billion, 400, around 450 million dollars. So it was a very big hit, and it was kind of a big cultural hit too. Um, but then as the years and the decades went by, people kind of forgot that it came out on June 8th, 1984, the same day as Ghostbusters, by the way, fun trivia for you. Ooh. That was a heck of a day at the, at the, at the 16 plex, seeing Gremlins and Ghostbusters. Um, and but 84 is one of those blockbuster summers. It's one of those years yeah. that had nothing but hit after hit after yeah. hit. Temple of Doom and Purple Rain and then later in the year Beverly Hills Cop. It was a very uh, very good year uh, uh, for 80s movies. But I think what happened is you know people forgot about the summer aspect of it and a lot of people you know who are, who are you know 30 and under have no idea that it came out in the summer and to them it's just a Christmas themed movie. So kind of like Die Hard. I, I wasn't gonna say the D word. The D word, yeah. But uh, yeah, Die Hard is a Christmas movie. Well, the funny thing is, you know, you see Bruce Willis and they ask him years ago, like, do, you know, uh, is Die Hard a Christmas movie? And he's like, Die Hard is not a Christmas movie. And I kind of wanted to say, hey, Bruce, I know you're in the movie and you're terrific in it. It's not really up to you <laughs> to decide whether Die Hard is a Christmas movie. It's up to you to decide whether Gremlins is a Christmas movie or Die Hard is a Christmas movie. The public decides, and they vote with their, with their remote control, and with their thumbs, and with their feet. And I, you know, over the years, you should see my phone on December 23rd, 4th, and 25th. <laughs> it blows, it's like, a, it's like a Jiffy Pop popcorn thing. It's like, bah, 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 bah. like, we're watching Gremlins, we're watching Gremlins. My family, my entire family is watching Gremlins. So it's a huge, seasonal hit, along, you know, right along there with A Christmas Story and It's a Wonderful Life, and of course It's a Wonderful Life, there's a small little clip of it in the movie, so it, it tips the cap to those old school movies. So it's 100% has morphed into a seasonal Christmas classic that is shown every year. And, and with that, it's become part of the zeitgeist of our entire culture. It is. It's very strange if you're me and you're watching, you know, CNN or whatever, flipping around on the news, and someone says, well, it looks like there's some gremlins in the Pentagon budget, and you're like, wait a second. 
Here, tell me about my flick here, you know? Yeah. Or somebody will say, like, well, the restaurant closed. I hope they didn't eat after midnight. You know, they'll do these references <laughs> all the time, woven through the fabric of the culture four decades later. And it's just, it's very, very trippy to see the impact. I mean, for health benefits, you should never eat after midnight anyway. Probably. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just one of those sayings. Um, of course, working in that movie, you got to work opposite Phoebe Cates. <laughs> and there's so many questions coming along like that, but, but uh, what I want to know is how was it working with her on the movie? Well, you know, Phoebe was so, uh, well, first of all, she was so hot at the time, and I don't necessarily mean physically. I mean, she was uh, kind of on fire from having been in Fast Times Ridgemont High, which was a big hit this, you know, a couple of summers before, or the summer before we shot it, 82. And so uh, it was funny for me because I was a complete unknown and I, I was, uh, they got, Warner Brothers had to put me up. I was a New Yorker and they flew me out and so was Phoebe, by the way. And so they flew us both out, put us up in Westwood uh, because I couldn't drive. So they figured we'll put you up in Westwood near UCLA because you can kind of walk everywhere and there's lots of shops and eateries and stuff like that. And so I would walk around Westwood with Phoebe and people would, especially young men, right, it's UCLA. <laughs> young men would lose their minds when they saw her and when they met her. You know, she'd be on the street and be like, hey, what's up? And they're like, hey, and this is Phoebe. And the guy would be like, hey, oh my God, it's you. You know, and they, would, they would just freak out at her because she was, you know, she was extremely beautiful, but she was, she was very um, modest about it. Instead of having sort of an attitude about the fact that she was a beautiful young woman, she was kind of like, What's the big deal? <laughs> like she did. I mean, she, she also became an essential part of culture, U.S. culture, especially I mean, for us '80s kids with a pause button on VCRs. <laughs> yeah, I you know I think she probably has some mixed feelings about that, but um, but she know. she became a star. She would become a star, and she had a very good career. It lasted about 15 years, and one of the nice things for her was that she managed in 1995 to simply walk away under her own power because she was married and is still married to Kevin Klein, and they have two kids and they're both extremely successful and wealthy. She doesn't, she did, just felt like been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Yeah. And uh, so she just kind of walked away after having done it and um, never really looked back. Hey, it's, it's Kevin Klein, really. Yeah, seriously. Um, with the movie, it goes through several different parts and one thing I noticed watching it the other day is early on in the movie, you guys send a drunk guy home in heavy machinery. <laughs> They're like, hey, you're, you've drunk too much. Please drive home in this giant heavy tractor. You'll get home fine. You're, you're totally fine with that. Well, you know, it is a different time. And also, <laughs> it, it's a small town and it, you can tell in the movie Funny you bring that scene up. That's the very first scene we shot in the movie over at Universal on the first night uh, with myself and Phoebe and Dick Miller, the late Dick Miller, who passed away a few years ago. Incredible Dick Miller. And, um, and yeah, you know, the idea is just it's a small town with like two stoplights and everybody's asleep and he can take his Kentucky Harvester snow plow, <laughs> probably hopefully not smash into somebody's gate and make it home okay, even though he's a little a little hammered from drinking beer at, at Dory's Tavern, but it was it was a different time and just people just didn't kind of like, they didn't think those things like, is this movie gonna impact people? They just were more busy and interested in telling a story and if you got it, you got it, and if you didn't, and if you didn't like it, well then you didn't, you know, it was kind of like. I, I thought that was just one of those cultural moments that it was totally fine in the 80s to smoke with your kids in the car not have seatbelts on and drive home drunk in a harvester. It's all good. One of those things. It was a different era. <laughs> Completely different era. Now, when we come up to the gremlins and uh, the, the puppetry involved. Sure. Um, obviously, first off, you're with uh, Gizmo and the different puppets with Gizmo. Did you have any issues working with a puppet or were you just like, hey, dude, this is, this is like, you know, Sesame Street, I'm, I'm, I'm totally into doing what I gotta do. Well, when I would have, well, you, you can see when I have some of my key scenes with Gizmo, they have switched from 
a puppet to a much more sophisticated animatronic creature. And the animatronic creature, you know, basically, uh, what did I do with Giz? Where did He's I right in front of you. He's right in front of me. So Giz, basically, he had about 14 or 15 wires coming right out of his butt right here. <laughs> and they would come down and to sort of camouflage it, obviously, because you don't want to give away the trick. They would go down my sleeve, so I'd hold them like this, and the wires would go down my sleeve. And the cables would all go down my body, they would take them to the side of my body, they'd go down my leg, and then they would cut a hole in my sock. Of course, it was the 80s, so I had much longer socks than these. <laughs> I had those athletic socks. And they would cut the hole, and the wires would go across the room. And each cable was connected to a joystick. And each joystick was operated by a separate person. One person would do the ears, one person would do the nose, one person would do the eyes, one person would do the hands, and they would all watch a monitor and had practiced for months so that it synchronized in a beautiful way and looked real. So when I was acting with Giz, the only thing that was different from what you see on the screen, what you see on the screen is exactly what I saw, was that he didn't have, make cute little noises like Howie Mandel, who voices Gizmo, uh, gave him. Instead, he would look at me and just kind of go, <laughs> and make little clicking and whirring noises. And you always knew you were in trouble when you heard like some bad noises. It would go like, <laughs> and then his like ear would snap off, and we'd be like, oh boy. And he would malfunction, and somebody would have pulled their joystick too tight. And then Chris Wayless, who was only 28 at the time when he designed this entire thing. He would come over and he, he wanted to curse so badly, but he never did. He'd just come over and go, oh boy, oh no, oh yeah, oh good. And then Joe Downey would be, how long is it gonna take, Wayless? And he'd be like, hang on a second, Joe. Yeah, um, four, maybe five hours? I'd be like, all right, everyone take five hours. And I'd be like, yes. Because then I could go over to Spielberg's office, which is about two blocks away, on the Warner Brothers lot, and play his millipede machine and pole position machine, oh, and, right. and, and all of his uh, video games. And I eventually played his millipede machine so much, and it, when I left, the secretary said, you know, Zach Galligan came here every day and played that millipede machine. And Spielberg said, well, if you liked it that much, let's just ship it to him. So they, one day I was home, Ding dong, and freight elevator door in the back of my apartment in Manhattan. <laughs> I opened the freight elevator door and they're like, you Zach Galgan? I'm like, yeah, I'm sign here, buddy. And I sign there and 10 foot, you know, six, six foot stand up millipede machine just shipped it to me. I'm like, love Steven, hope you enjoy it. Do, so, now, do you still have that millipede machine? Well, this was pre eBay. So the answer is no. <laughs> I probably would have held on to that bad boy oh. had Steven sign it. But basically what happened is my mother became obsessed with Millipede. And like, it was crazy. After about a year or two, I'd come home, she'd be at like scoring four or five million. And it would just be like, mom, 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 Zach, mom, mom, mom. I'd be like, mom, what are you doing? And, uh, and eventually we wore out the tube around 1989, 1990. That's an easy fix. And we didn't know it was an easy fix because we didn't know anything about stand-up millipede machines. So we were like, let's just junk it. So we junked it. Oh. It was in some junkyard oh. 34 years ago. Oh. For, so, yeah. for the record, I have 37 arcade machines. Wow. Yeah. No. I don't have a millipede, but I have two centipedes. Should have contacted you. Yeah. So that's what happened. That's how Gizmo worked. And it was, you know, trial and error. And, um, you know, we would, I had to really be on my game because there was a good gizmo take and a bad Zach take. They were using the good gizmo take. So I basically had to have a good Zach take every single time or else some of the not so great Zach takes would end up in the movie and that wouldn't be good for me. So it was, um, it was difficult. Probably the most difficult part was that they would have, the cables would go down and they would go down sort of on the inside of my leg and they were, uh, the cables had little small separations between them. Mm -hmm. And so when they pulled on the cable, the cables would squeeze together and all of the hairs on the inside of my leg would get caught in the cables and pulled out. 
So by the time the shooting was over, I basically had no hair on my arms and my side and on the inside of my leg. So yeah, you just basically, when you were acting, you were just kind of like, okay, guess no, let's go over to the table. So you might be able to see me wince every now and then if you look real closely. Well, I that's now something to go back and watch tonight for those scenes where he's wincing talking to Gizmo. Hopefully you don't see it that much. Hopefully I'm just sort of smiling through the agony. But well, we, we just have to, we have to hunt for those that's specific right. scenes. If you, want to see, if you want to hunt for something, watch, watch for this. We did a thing called the, switch, the old switcheroo, which is I would just have a remote control gizmo, and I would take the gizmo over, and they preset another gizmo with the cables over here. Like, say this was a, like a, a, a shelf or a desk or something. They'd cut a hole in it and have all the cables going down underneath it, and they'd have a preset gizmo. And what I would do is go, okay, gizmo, let's go over to the table. And the camera would sort of lag behind me. And I would stick this off camera and someone would grab it. And when the camera panned over, it would pan over to the preset one. So you can do the old, you can see the old switcheroo, especially in the scene in the bathroom where I bandage his head. Um, that's a real one where you can, if you look real closely and you know it's happening, just kind of see it, but it's it's pretty well done. Slide I'm ahead. going to definitely look for that when it comes up. Um, now, Gremlins is family friendly, but it becomes a little scary. You know, I hear a lot of little kids like, "Oh, I don't like the first one. It's scary." And I thought that's an interesting thing because it's it's Spielberg, it's Amblin, it's family friendly, but then it is a little frightening at some certain points. Well, you've got to remember this. Summer of 1983, the year before, summer of 82, you had E.T. and Poltergeist. If you've ever seen Poltergeist, dude rips his face off in the mirror and everyone's like, what's that? Oh, okay, it was a hallucination. But it's absolutely disgusting and terrifying and that movie's, you know, pretty scary. Again, in the kid, as a kid in the 80s, you only got to watch seven VHS tapes. Yeah. And there was Poltergeist, E.T., and Gremlins. And don't forget, Spielberg did Jaws, and I find Jaws pretty frightening, and I think a lot of people who saw it in the theater, when the head pops out of the, the ship, when he's under the ship yeah. looking, and the theater would scream. Yeah, and, and uh, for the record, the Jaws mechanical thing did work worse than Gizmo. Yeah, pretty, I mean, we had a lot of problems with Gizmo on the first one, and then Chris Wayless was so just completely ptsd by working on Gremlins for two years. I mean, he was so, by the time it was over, he was like, I never want to see a Gremlin again. So when they offered him Gremlins 2, he passed. He's like, he literally got, he's, he said in an interview, he got PTSD on the phone when they called to offer him. They're like, do you want to do Gremlins? He was like, Gremlins, what, what? And then, you know, he started like shaking. Oh. And so he, he passed. And um, that's when they offered it to Rick Baker. And then Rick Baker, who's arguably, you know, the greatest special effects guy who's ever lived, at least the greatest makeup guy who's ever lived, and did Men in Black and American Werewolf of London and Gorillas in the Mist and won seven Oscars and 12 nominations. Basically had a category invented because of the stuff yeah. that he did in American Werewolf in London. He came in in Gremlins 2 and revamped Gizmo and came up with a really good idea, which is let's not have Zach carry Gizmo around so he, the cables don't have to be strapped to him. Let's have him in a toolbox or let's put him in a file cabinet or let's put him on the sink. So. It was genius for me because when we did Gremlins 2, I never had to have any cables strapped to my body ever. You had time to grow that hair back. That's real. Oh yeah, I, six years in between the movies, so yeah, it had grown back. <laughs> and then of course we get to the bad Gremlins, the evil Gremlins. The you know now what we know is the monsters with Stripe and his gang, and how that transformed the movie from where as you were slowly being a nice family friendly. We got a new pet. You know, oh, we didn't do something right, and they turn bad. Yeah, so we get the, the evil gremlins. Well, Joe Dante always used to tell me that the, the name of the movie shouldn't be Gremlins. It should be, It's a Wonderful Lizard of Oz from Hell. <laughs> and so he wants a little bit of Wizard of Oz in it, a little bit of lizards in it, a little bit of scariness, and a little bit of, you know, beautiful, happy, small town, everything all mixed together. 
But yeah, I mean, you know, the whole point of Gremlins is to kind of soften you up in the first 45, 50 minutes and make you go, oh, Gizmo's so cute. And then be like, now that, you're, now that your guard is down, we're gonna knee you in the stomach with Gremlins and scare you and freak you out. So it's like, you know, it's, it's two sides of the same coin, the yin and the yang. I, I tell you, as long as he didn't try to kill me, I wouldn't mind one of the bad Gremlins. I thought those guys were cool. Well, that's the thing about them. Hopefully you sort of like, you find them detestable and at the same time you find them relatable and then you also hopefully find them somewhat hilarious, so. Because they can break dance. They can. Yeah, they can. That, that was a big thing, uh, if you guys know, in the 80s. Being able to break dance, like, was it? But when we shot the movie, one of the biggest movies out at the time was Flashdance. And e Flashdance was everywhere. And that song, uh, uh, I mean, He's a Maniac, yeah. by Michael Sabella was everywhere. And, and with her going, you know, in, 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 in a moment in time, that video where it shows her doing the dancing and, and stuff like that. And then we have the gremlin dancing and then flipping it just like the music video. Yep. And yeah. flipping it again. Basically what they did was, and what I think really drove the, the special effects guy, Chris Wayless, over the edge was um, they got so frustrated, everyone in the crew got so frustrated with Gizmo breaking down so much that they put up a sign uh, on the wall when they were doing the second unit stuff saying, please write down creative ways in which to torture Gizmo. <laughs> and so the crew members would be like, put him on a dartboard, throw darts at him, maybe hit him with trains, this and that, because they were all just so furious at, at the, cr the critter for breaking down all the time. So a lot of those ideas that were outlandish and stuff somehow made their way into the movie. Now the, the bigger gremlins, how much more complex were they than Gizmo? Well, probably the most complicated shot in the whole movie is the scene in the kitchen where uh, my mother sees the gremlin sort of digging in the mixer for the first time and he, he kind of leans up, pricks his ears up and, and, and sort of is like, did I hear something? Is there somebody here? And that, that was a very complicated shot. And that gremlin, I think, had something like, you know, 40 or 50 cables and could do all sorts of different muscular movements with its face and its eyebrows and whatever. And they really practiced a long time with that. So it was a good three or four months of nonstop practice by the puppeteers and the animatronics people before they were ready to, you know, before they were camera ready. And it's a, it's a great shot because those are kind of the establishing shots of the gremlins and the fact that your mom can kill them. She murdered two of them right off the bat. Yeah, let's not give too much away. Oh, yeah, two people here haven't seen it yet. Okay, by the way, people, gremlins die. Yeah. Uh, there, I did it. There you go. Yeah, it's totally done. Um, but a lot of people ask about the giant brain that you've seen a couple times here. This is an actual prop from the movie. And when I showed it to Zach, he's like, oh my god, I remember that. Yeah, there's, there, you'll see there's a scene uh, where uh, I bring Gizmo to my science teacher and he takes a blood sample to sort of determine what the creature is. And then later on, he's showing a, a classic 50s movie about the heart that they used to show in health classes and stuff like that. And, and in the background on his desk, you can see that brain. There were two of them, and one of them was supposed to not fall, and one of them was supposed to fall. And as you can see, that was the one that, that fell and got this is This is the falling one. That's yeah. the one that falls. For some reason, they were not allowed to break the one that was not allowed to fall. And so they had to make the second brain just for that one shot. Sure. It's one of those things. I think, I think what it was was they had to do the brain falling and then they needed to do another scene in the classroom like three weeks later and they couldn't have a broken brain because it was earlier in the movie and hadn't broken. Because most people know, uh, or, or if you don't know, probably 99% of the movies that you see are shot out of sequence. They're not shot from the beginning to the end. In fact. Very, very few movies are shot in sequence, and the only few that I can think of are like My Fair Lady was shot in sequence. So it was uh, amazingly Mad Max Fury Road. Wow. Was shot, just first shot, and the last shot in the movie is the last shot that they shot on the final day. But that's very, very rare. Thinking on, obviously, decades now, Gremlins out, what is your favorite moment of Gremlins? Besides kissing Phoebe? Well, dude, that's a given. Your second favorite moment of Gremlins. Uh, let's see. I'm kind of really partial to um, the, the scene where I get Gizmo for the first time as a Christmas present. 
and the reveal when I open the box. You shake it. When you see it, well, I think it's, I think it, I don't know what I think it is, yeah. but I, I'm not, I, you just shake it to see if you can tell the contents. And, uh, and then eventually you open it. When, once I realize it's a live creature, I can calm down a little bit, <laughs> stop shaking it. And uh, yeah, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a pretty iconic scene. It's a great introductory shot to Gizmo. And, and uh, I think when we saw the first screening at the Man's Chinese or Brownman's Chinese Theater, when they have that first close up of Gizmo, the entire theater, and every single female in the audience was immediately like, oh my God, I love him. He, he was we Grogu were like, before Kachin. Grogu was cool. He was the, he was the, yes, he was the OG Grogu for yeah. sure. Um, of course, now, watching you at the show the last couple days and here, the number one question everybody walked up to ask you, are you going to be in Gremlins 3? Well, I mean, the thing is that there's a script written for Gremlins 3 by Chris Columbus, who wrote this one. Uh, there's been no official word on even what Warner Brothers thought about the script, or whether they're enthusiastic about doing it or not. And that's largely due to the fact that we've been working on Gremlins Secrets of the Mogwai, the animated series. Not just one season, but two seasons, 20 total episodes. And Warner Brothers has done somewhere in the area of 25 to 30 million dollars on this animated series. So if you know anything about how corporations work, it's pretty difficult to imagine that they would spend that amount of money on a cartoon if they didn't have some kind of live action movie planned to follow it once it had concluded its run. So I'm you're saying the there's a chance. I'm saying there's a very, very solid chance that in the next two, three, four years, there will be some kind of Gremlins 3, because there will not be a remake. Chris Columbus owns part of the rights to it, and he refuses to allow it to be remade, because he thinks the first one is perfect, and he's, it's his you know, first script, and he's in love with it. It's funny, I remember meeting Chris on the script. I was 19, he was like 23 years old, and we were both... Both of us basically couldn't even shave. We had baby faces. We were both like, isn't this crazy? He's like, oh, no, it's crazy. Look at this is Steven. Oh my God, it's so cool, you know? And now it's 40 years later. And there you go. Awesome. So, where can they watch this animated uh, series? HBO Max has all 10 episodes, and my guess is season two. Uh, it premiered last May, and my guess is season two will probably premiere sometime this year, too. And then uh, uh, probably later in the year. And then my guess is they'll, you know, just let it run and educate the young masses about the joys of Gremlins and Gremlins mythology. And once they feel that it's saturated a market that, you know, hasn't seen a Gremlins movie since 1990, you're talking 34 years ago. That's a long time to go in between sequels. So they need to lay some groundwork for people who've never seen it. And you're talking about more groundwork than the Mountain Dew commercial. Correct. Which did bring you back to all of our hearts. The Mountain Dew commercial was a lot of fun. We shot that all in one day. And actually, if you want to know a really kind of juicy bit of trivia, I got there and the, Grim, the gizmo was there and they, they'd done a little nice thing where they'd made him a little older and made little gray whiskers on his beard and everything like that. And I got a little choked up when I saw him. He looked up at me and was like, ah, blah, blah, you know, and it was like very, very surreal. Kind of like, imagine if you had a dog 30 years ago and it passed away and then suddenly the dog came back, comes back and you hang out with it for a day. It was like having the return of your pet. <laughs> but here's the interesting thing. I was like, how is this technology so incredible unless they're planning to make a Gremlins 3? The guy was like, well, it's Baby Yoda and we kind of ripped the Baby Yoda off and put a Gremlin skin on it, so there you go. And I was like, oh wow. We, we do have some giveaways. Everyone have their little red tickets. And we're going to 